Hi, everybody. Welcome to our UCLA Emmett Institute panel on climate justice in the US, the search for equity. I think I'm just going to wait another minute for people to enter from the waiting room and then we'll get started. Great. Okay, so hi again, welcome. Um, as some of you may know, this is the kickoff panel of the annual symposium of the Emmett Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. This is the first year we're doing it in this format and I'm really thrilled to see so many of you with us here this morning. I'm, I'm Kara Horowitz, the co-executive director of the Emmett Institute at UCLA Law School and I have the pleasure of moderating today's conversation with our terrific panelists. Um, before we jump in, I'm going to start with some gratitude and some ground rules for all of us today. Um, the gratitude comes first. I'm going to thank many of our co-sponsors at UCLA Law School. We couldn't have done this event in this way without the help and input of our co-sponsors, including the Critical Race Studies Program at UCLA Law School, the Promise Institute for Human Rights, Native Nations Law and Policy Center, the Environmental Law Society and our Journal of Environmental Law and Policy. So thank you to all our partners. And also thank you to the folks at the Emmett Institute who helped bring this event together, including especially our fellow Beth Kent, our communications director, Daniel Melling, and our wonderful program administrator, Heather Morphew. So as for ground rules, just a reminder, we have a lot of people in the event today and I'm thrilled about that. Just if you could remember to keep yourselves muted during the Zoom, um, that'll help us with background noises. And I will be monitoring the chat. We've opened up the chat so that you guys can chat with each other and chat with us all along the way. I'll be looking at the chat as best I can all along the way, and I'll be looking for questions. And we will be saving a significant amount of time at the end for questions for our panelists too. And the way to get those questions to us is again, to just type them up in the chat and we'll be paying attention to those. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to begin with a land acknowledgement. As a land grant institution, UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. We acknowledge the presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. And we pay our respects to past, present, and emerging leaders. And with that, let's get underway. I really couldn't be more thrilled to kick off our symposium with a panel on climate justice, featuring these four brilliant women who are with us here today, all working hard to make the United States a more just and equitable place to live. Um, I was telling them just before the Zoom went live that um, it was accidental in many respects that we wound up with a panel of four terrific women doing this work, but in many ways reflective of the reality of who works on climate justice in the United States. Largely, it is the women in our communities who are doing a lot of this important work. So I'm thrilled that it wound up this way. Um, this is a year, as all of us know, that has stressed many of our households, our families, our neighborhoods, and our communities. But these stresses have really been felt differently by different populations in the U.S. Across the board, we've seen, for example, COVID-19 hit people of color much harder than others. We've seen the economic downturn hit women in the workplace much harder than men. This is two examples. And climate change is another growing stressor on all our communities. And it also hits our most vulnerable communities the hardest. So as many of us know, low-income communities, disadvantaged communities, they're much um, more likely to be harmed by things like worsening storms, sea level rise, urban heat problems, natural resource damage. This isn't really news. Um, they also have the least ability to build resilience against these threats. And it turns out that our responses to the threat of climate change, if we don't take enough care in shaping them, can also work in, worsen these inequities. And so these four speakers today are leaders who are working with communities across the United States um, in different ways and on the ground to reduce these inequities and to work toward climate justice, which is a term we're gonna spend some time today defining and, and understanding and unpacking. Um, and then Dr. Martinez, of course, who is with us here today, hello, Dr. Martinez, is at the heart of the Biden administration's team, really trying to think about solutions to these problems. So I'm thrilled to have you all. 
I'll introduce you all very, very briefly. Please know that um, the bios for each of these speakers are available on our symposium website if you want to hear more about them. Um, Yoka Arditi Roca is the executive director of the Clio Institute, Hi Yoka, which is Florida's only climate focused nonprofit working to build climate literacy and to mobilize climate action for a just, resilient future. Dr. Cecilia Martinez is the Senior Director for Environmental Justice at the White House Council for Environmental Quality, or CEQ. In that role, she coordinates the whole of government environmental justice agenda of the Biden administration. And previously, um, she was Executive Director at the Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy. Hi, great to have you. Uh, Marissa Ramirez is the Senior Community Climate Strategy Manager for the People and Communities Program at NRDC or the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, there she works with neighbors and local leaders, primarily in underserved communities of color, to provide tools for a more equitable and sustainable future. She's also led some research, some interesting research, to uncover the links between climate change, displacement, and gentrification in the U.S. And then Keisha Sexton is the Deputy Director of Organizing at Mothers Out Front. Hi, Keisha. She's a climate justice advocate and leader. She's passionate about racial and social justice and found her way into the climate justice space as part of her work to build a movement across race and class to ensure that all children have a livable climate. So again, I'm thrilled to have you here. I wanna kick off our discussion of climate justice with again, a pretty foundational question, which is what is climate justice to you? How do you define it? And how do you see the fight for climate justice being advanced by the work that you do? Um, and I'll take this in the following order. I think each of you are, um, are gonna talk for something like eight minutes to start us off. Um, and I'll start with Marissa. Thanks so much, Marissa. Thank you so much, Kara. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for hosting this really important conversation today. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you. Let's see, can you see my slides? Yes. So I work with the Natural Resources Defense Council, I'm the climate lead for the SPARC initiative, which I'll talk a little bit about, working with communities across the country on equitable and sustainable development. So I'll talk a little bit about the questions that Kara asked on climate justice um, in our current context, uh, the SPARC initiative, uh, climate change and displacement, and some community-led solutions on climate justice. Uh, what I want to leave us with today is really that climate justice is not just about greening and cleaning poor communities of color. Um, we need to really address what is the root cause of environmental injustice, the related health inequity and wealth disparities, and in doing so, you know, also considering current and future climate impacts. So, you know, I won't be able to track this going along, but I think we all have our personal experiences with climate justice. So maybe if you want to write a few sentences in the chat, we can kind of see how other people are coming uh, to this question today as well. Um, so just jumping in, you know, as Kara had mentioned, we're working and living in this field in 2020. It's this year of converging crises, health crises, racial uprisings, and climate disasters. Um, you know, and even today, just mourning again, remembering Dante Wright, uh, you know, not yet another senseless death um, of a black man by police. And there's just no words to describe this compounding English. Um, but where I'm finding hope is in the first few months of the administration and, you know, race, racial equity, climate, health, economic recovery has really been at the forefront and a number of Biden's executive order, um, orders have underscored these priorities. And I think as we move forward, our goal is not to return to normal. Um, our normal was based on racist and greed-based systems that have only worked for a percentage of us, um, but to create a new vision where we can all prosper. Uh, and as a mixed race Latina in a historically white institution, I'm acutely aware of where we might wanna go on climate justice, but also where we've come from. Uh, and also, I also come from the sciences. Um, look, I worked in cancer research, looking at new therapies for cancers. And so many people ask, you know, how did I get here? But a lot of the treatments that I worked on were also based on compounds found in the environment, which have had a cultural significance to native populations. And 
I just share this because I've spent my career on resolving some of the uh, unintended consequences, but also uplifting the synergies between health, justice, and environmental stewardship. Uh, so SPARC is one of the projects that I work on. It's the Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge. It's a collective of over 100 national and local partners across the country with multiple sectors in six cities, uh, Atlanta, Memphis, Chicago, Bay Area, and of course, LA. Our, our work focuses on systems change to influence policies and practices that shape our cities. And because we're focused on system change through this lens of racial equity, are and addressing the barriers that that fate that communities of color face for building relationships and shifting power to community that shapes our work. Um, so through this work, displacement became an overarching theme of our initiative and some of our partners work in communities around, for instance, the LA River revitalization or the Beltline in Atlanta, facing pressures on both home and culture. Uh, and it really became clear from our work that living in communities, there's multiple dimensions to climate change and displacement of people, especially those who are most vulnerable. So, you know, before I delve into like what we're doing, I wanna consider the history because it's really critical in understanding the fact that the least responsible for the harm are most burdens. So we know, um, of course, this for historic development patterns, including lead, uh, redlining have led to segregation and disinvestment in communities and climate exacerbates this. Uh, we've seen this in places like Chicago with repeated urban flooding. Beyond redlining, we can go even further back in history to see how our laws resulted in displacement and subsequent poverty today, like the Indo Indian Removal Act and others. Um, and, and, and many of these are different, but I, I wanna point to the fact that this involuntary movement of, of communities uh, has happened. And in many cases, our communities that had had a history of land stewardship and environmental stewardship who are now uh, disconnected from that. and, and um, and so coming back to today, climate drives where and how we live. And it's often actually the same communities who've been displaced in the past who are bearing this climate burden today. Uh, and this cycle is perpetuated with development patterns that are disconnected to transit or housing or other elements that may further emissions increases. So this is sort of how we came to um, thinking about this in Spark where we conducted some research that included a li literature review uh, of over 300 papers in partners, partnership with the Urban Displacement Project, um, as well as a survey of practitioners in the field with EcoADAPT. And the aim was really to frame how climate change leads to displacement, some of the unintended consequences, and how to prevent maladaptive solutions. So really quickly, I'm just going to cover some key points around inequities that persist in climate-induced displacement, some of the unintended consequences, and this need to have more coordinated planning. So our findings just affirm the intuition that I think many of us already have that climate change directly and indirectly exacerbates inequity. And there's moderate and strong relationships based on the stressor, but ultimately inequity persists across the board. So you might expect climate shock, shocks like storms or wildfires to directly lead to displacement. You might lose your home in a fire. Climate stressors also lead to displacement indirectly. So think of Miami, for example, as sea level rises, you have wealthier residents moving away from the coast, which means existing higher elevation areas are becoming more uh, desirable. So as a result, we're seeing climate gentrification where property values are now going up. There's housing pressure, there's cultural pressure on um, under-resourced communities of color living in these uh, neighborhoods like um, Little Haiti. And, you know, just to reinforce this link around climate and wealth inequity, when you look at um, disaster prone, prone U.S. counties between 1999 and 2013, Black and Latino residents lost between $27,000 and $29,000 of wealth each during this period. However, white residents gained $126,000 per person. That is real, that is an astounding statistic. Um, and so also thinking about displacement, it can also lead to uh, the indirect displacement. For instance, when energy costs rise, home insurance prices go up or housing prices themselves increase when sustainable amenities come in. So these are three strategies that our partners have been working on, parks, transit-oriented development or energy efficiency. 
And, and if we just look interestingly at energy efficiency, the research overwhelmingly support that property values, again, increase once a home is upgraded to include energy and solar. And this is really important in a place, for instance, like LA, where roughly 600,000 people already spend up to 90% of their income on housing already. So we don't wanna be in a situation where we're lowering energy bills just for rent burdens to go up. But we also want people to access these benefits as well. Um, so we found that there are, thankfully, many strategies to address these intersecting issues. And there's an opportunity now to organize ourselves to elevate scale and implement some of these innovative policies. So um, one piece that we're focused on in Spark is community stewardship, which really means ensuring that funding for housing stability goes to community-based partners to acquire and still steward the land and keep it affordable in the long term. So um, if you're familiar with the neighborhood stabilization program, this is not an entirely new pro uh, concept, but we need to prioritize funding for those who need it most, like tenants, small landlords, small businesses, homeowners in specific areas, and especially organizations with a focus on racial equity in their mis mission. So in conclusion, everything is connected. And as an environmental group to get to justice, we need to be part of these conversations around housing, race, health, and community if we want to ensure that resilience benefits actually reach people. Um, so we've covered you know, climate justice today, spark displacement, uh, and some of our solutions, and we need to help others make this connection. So not only do we want our homes and communities to be green, but we want our green homes and resilient projects to be just. Um, I hope that you will join me in sharing this information and supporting one another. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marissa. I know that was a lot, um, and I am confident we're going to have time to delve into um, some of those concepts in, in a little more depth in our conversation. So thanks for teeing it up. Um, Keisha, I invite you to, to talk next about what climate justice means for you and your work. Yes. Um, well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Keisha Sexton. I am based and born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, I must say I have a one-year-old French bulldog who's sleeping. And if you hear any snoring in the background, that is him, not a, another human. <laughs> so I wanna give you that heads up. Um, but I thought I can approach this conversation today by sharing my own personal experience about how I um, came into the environmental climate space and to also then share a little bit about my work um, and if there's time, kind of talk about um, a, a case scenario of maybe someone who's African-American and how they intersect with cl climate justice. If not, I'm sure through the questions and answer, I'll have more time to dive into the real life um, example. Uh, but let me first start with my, my story uh, because in my work as a community organizer, we recognize the benefit of stories and how through storytelling, you can get to understand what are the issues and why are, um, why, why are things the way they are? And so as uh, Angelino, as someone that's African-American, um, I really resonated with um, council member Kevin DeLeon, who described himself as an accidental environmentalist. Uh, when I heard him say that, I said, wow, that's me. <laughs> uh, I had no clue that I would be sitting here participating and engage in this movement today. Um, and the reason why is because when I first think about my introduction um, to meeting environmentalists, they were often white, they were often from Culver City, and they often made me feel like my issues related to race wasn't a priority, that I had to focus specifically on the environment and that if I wasn't focused on the environment then all this other stuff doesn't matter and as we have and as we know in 2020 and during a year when black folks are saying black lives matter it's really offensive for a black person to hear that our issues related to race our issues related to the education system the criminal justice system all of that doesn't matter because the most important thing that we need to fight about is the environment. Um, but that was my introduction um, to, to the environmental space. And it was, um, and somehow I found myself in this space and it was through uh, LA Neighborhood Land Trust where Beth Kent and I actually met 
Um, I was a community organizer. I was working in South LA. I definitely have experience working with black and brown communities. And when I learned about LA Neighborhood Land Trust, they were using an intersectional approach that it wasn't just about building green spaces, but it was about building green spaces, uh, building green spaces in low-income communities of color, and also recognizing that in order for us to have a livable climate or a healthy, thriving community, that we also must talk about issues like affordable housing, that we also must talk about issues like um, quality education system. And so it was then in this space that I joined as a community organizer that I began to realize that being a part of the environmental movement does not mean that I need to forget about all those other issues that I'm dealing with as a person of color, that it's about addressing the, taking a holistic approach. And as a social worker, which I am a master, I have my master's in social work, where we often learn when we meet our clients that um, we have to fully understand the depth of their problem. And when we start working with them, we have to create an intervention or treatment plan that is a holistic approach. And we usually bring in different um, specialists to ensure that we're wrap, creating a wraparound of services around the individual or the family. And so for me, climate justice is a holistic approach to fighting against um, the inequities that communities of color or frontline communities are experiencing. Um, and in order for us to address this problem here in the United States of America, we must be holistic. That the solutions um, are not siloed, or the problem is not siloed. And so the solutions should not be siloed either. And so, on a personal level, that's how I understand climate justice, that it's a holistic approach, that we're gonna be, we're gonna be looking at solutions that help communities of color deal with a multitude of issues that they're experiencing. On a professional level, as a community organizer, um, now a director of organizing at Mothers Out Front, which is a national organization. It is an organization that works with moms throughout the United States of America to really organize them to create solutions uh, to ensure that their children have a livable climate. We're a traditional white organization. Um, and over the years, we recognize that in order for us to really address the magnitude of the problem, we have to one, diversify our moms, and two, we have to be more expansive with our solutions. And so today we are really taking approach that where we're prioritizing organizing communities of color we're prioritizing organizing frontline communities, which frontline communities are mostly communities of color, but all the times they're not um, communities of color. Um, we're also prioritizing solutions that are climate justice. Um, and, for, and climate justice for us means that we're taking an intersectional approach, that we are talking about green jobs, that we are talking about affordable how we're talking about electrifying and uh, affordable house and affordable housing. We're talking about um, tr transportation equity. We're talking about um, and we're we're understanding we're learning because we're still learning what is the intersection between the criminal justice system and the climate. What is the what is the role that the fossil fuel industry plays? Uh, um, within the criminal justice system. So we're, we're asking these questions to better understand the extent of the problem so that our solutions match the, the problem. And so we're not perfect because <laughs> we're an organization, we're learning, we're, I don't wanna get up here and say that we figured it out and we're the, we, we are the climate justice organization. That is not true. We are in this phase as an organization where we're saying, we need, to do, we need to diversify our movement and two, we need to make sure that our solutions are climate justice oriented. And so by us recognizing that, we're being more intentional around the solutions that we're putting together and we're talking about equity and we're asking that elected officials prioritize intersectional approach and also um, equity. And so let me, um, Cora asked me to provide a real tangible example of what, how climate justice might intersect. And so I wanna do that by, 
one, checking the time, and two, uh, oh, about two more minutes. So I, I would, um, I would say quickly, um, if you're if you're from LA like me, you might realize that um, that most of the fracking, at least that happens in LA. If you ever drove through South LA, um, I live currently in Signal Hill. I can literally walk in multiple directions and I have fracking all surrounded by me. I also have explosions that happen regularly. And so as a person of color, I am dealing with fracking, I'm dealing with explosions, but I'm also worried about whether or not I'm gonna get stopped by the police and what type of treatment I'm gonna have as a result of that. I'm also worried about whether or not my son or daughter is gonna to go to school and whether or not they're gonna have a quality education. So if you meet me, then it's gonna be important that you talk about all of these things that I'm experiencing and that the solutions in order to get my attention have to address all of those things. And later in the conversation, I'll give more examples because I think Texas um, and Hurricane Katrina are other examples of how climate justice shows up and impact communities of color. That's great. Thank you so much, Keisha, for sharing those thoughts. I love the importation of the phrase wraparound solutions from the social work context. I think that fits really nicely here. I appreciate it. And we definitely will have time to delve in more concretely to some of those examples. Um, Yoka, you want to jump in on the topic of climate justice in your work? Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you, Cara, for having me here today and, and for the and the center for the invitation. I'm, I'm thrilled to get engaged in, in this already uh, energizing and, and so meaningful conversation. As you mentioned, you know, the Clio Institute is a, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that has been working in Florida at the local state level since um, 2010. And our sole purpose is to build climate literacy and spurring climate action for a just and sustainable future for all. And so instead of me kind of going over what we do and before we getting into what we feel climate justice is, I'd like to just show a, a, a real quick video um, that really re simplifies what we do at the local and, and state level and also some of the work uh, that we do embedding climate justice and some of our programmatic uh, work. I want you to ask yourselves those tough questions the ones we avoid, how we want to live, what do we want for our children, what do we want for our planet. Our atmosphere is so finely tuned for what we need and we're treating it like a dumping ground, a sewer. The health impact of climate change is a global problem and we see the results of that on a local level. If we fail to act now, then we will leave behind a fundamentally degraded planet for our children and grandchildren, a planet that resembles the future's that have been portrayed in dystopian Hollywood films, unprecedented uh, inundation of our coastlines, droughts, floods, heat waves, super storms. That's the future that we will see if we fail to act on climate. The Clio Institute was founded in 2010 with the drive to educate and empower South Floridians to act on climate. Founded by Caroline Lewis, a science teacher by training, her vocation led her to understand what was causing people's apathy towards the glooming climate crisis, knowledge. We're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. Today, the Clio Institute is the number one nonprofit organization for climate education, engagement, and advocacy. Through programs like the Clio Speakers Network, Clio trains people to become climate speakers by breaking down the science, impacts, and solutions. Clio's educational efforts are backed by a world-class expert advisory council of scientists, environmentalists, teachers, and government officials. While the world is already feeling the impacts of our changing climate, not everyone is feeling it the same way. Clio is a leader in the climate justice movement, providing the resources and tools to the most vulnerable communities in South Florida that are on the front lines of the climate crisis. I want to be an outreach for them. Building communities resilience through women is the cornerstone of our Empowering Resilient Women program. By teaming up with community members like the YWCA, Clio is able to empower and educate women on how better to prepare for more extreme weather events like hurricanes while building community. 
Clio works to remove barriers and build a wider coalition to fight climate change across faith-based communities, elected officials, and municipalities, schools, and cultural organizations. One of the most important voices that Clio continues to amplify is that of our youth. What do we want? When do we want it? Their Gen Clio program meets regularly with students across the region, training them to be climate ambassadors in their schools and communities. Dear elected officials, This is a crisis. Do your job. We'll be watching. Clio recently launched its Climate Resilient Schools initiative to bring their program into the classrooms while building a robust climate curriculum for Miami-Dade public schools. I like the Clio Institute because it takes the time to educate people about the importance of climate change and the things that we can do to improve our world. You can have your voice heard too. Fund our climate action work today. The future of Florida is in your hands. So I think that really uh, summarized um, in, in, a, in, in a much shorter version what the Clio Institute does. And we approach climate literacy advocacy in an interdisciplinary holistic manner, um, same as what Keisha was talking about. We create multiple access points to engage diverse audiences in understanding the climate crisis and to embrace scal scalable solutions, particularly those for those that are will be impacted the most, like the poor, the color, the elderly, our children and women. And for too long, the climate movement has been seen an environmental issue, and at the Clio always, at the Clio Institute, Institute has always seen it as a humanitarian issue, a racial justice issue, a human and civil rights issue, and a gender issue. You know, we all live under the same roof, call an atmosphere, but not everybody's experienced the climate crisis the same. So to define it, I think we must begin with recognizing key groups are differently affected by a warming climate. And many victims of a changing climate also have been, have been disproportionately, have the low responsibility for the warming pollution in the first place, particularly in developing countries that produce fewer emissions per capita um, than it is the case with major polluting co uh, countries. Climate and environmental just injustice is about people of color who are breathing toxic ash from mountaintop um, removal or coal plants in so many of our neighborhoods. It's about the fact that in many communities, it's far easier to find a bag of Cheetos than it is to find fresh vegetables. It's about low income communities and people of color not having the safety nets to withstand and bounce back from increasing dangerous storms and or floods or drought. And it's also about seniors and people with disabilities and people with chronic illnesses that have a harder time living through periods of severe heat or being able to quickly and safely evacuate from major storms or fire. It is also about women being disproportionately affected by natural disasters and around the world, sometimes nine times more than men, being faced with migration for survivor or experiencing domestic violence or sexual abuse after hurricanes or other related natural events. And it's also about our kids and their children, which will be experiencing more profound impacts of a warming climate than us as it worsens over time. I think at the end of the day, we will achieve justice where all people, despite of race, income, gender, age, have equal right to the atmosphere and the resources our planet provides us not only to survive, but to thrive. And so I'm looking forward to the conversation where we can really get into more detail and, 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 and engage with all of you here in the panel. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Yoka. And then last but not least, Dr. Martinez, I'd love to hear how you and the Biden administration think about define climate justice and are, are starting to tackle it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And really appreciate being here and being with this panel of amazing women who are doing incredible work, both personally and in their own organizations. Um, well, I'm Cecilia Martinez, um, and I have a very unique position, a very historical position. Um, for the first time in this country, um, environmental justice is the center and focal point um, of both presidential candidates who were running in this election, but also um, with now President Biden, um, his national climate agenda. 
And this is my position is a unique position and a historic position as well, because it's the first time there has been a senior director for environmental justice in a White House office. Um, so I don't take that um, issue in that context lightly. That bears a whole lot of responsibility in making sure that things get done. Um, and I have to say, it's just been a privilege and an honor um, to be able to be in this position, but acknowledge that this position um, didn't just happen. This position has been built on decades of work from the environmental justice community historically. Um, and fortunately, I have had the privilege and honor of working with many of the leaders of the environmental justice movement, some of the founders of the environmental justice movement, who have been doing this work for decades um, with no visibility, with very little resources, with fighting for their communities in a, in, uh, with little um, sense of hope in some cases, but continuing to do the work nonetheless. And I name that because I think this really is a historic turning point for us. And we have to take advantage of it in the best possible way. What does climate justice, I'll start with what does climate justice mean to me personally, and then talk a little bit about how I think that translates into the administration's agenda. So climate justice is in the ideal sense of the world, is that no harm will come to both human communities and our natural ecosystems as a result of human induced climate change. Now that's a tall order. Because we both have to understand where does climate change come from? What is the root cause of climate change? And some of our speakers have already begun to talk about that. But let me just point this in a racially, um, racial way. When we talk about climate change, one of the first things we say is, well, it's, it's due to the existence of fossil fuels, our reliance on fossil fuels in an industrialization of industrialized economy. Um, which produces greenhouse gases, carbon, notably, um, which is a global pollutant. But when we look historically how we got here, we have to pay attention to the racialized factors that have gotten us to this place. So, for example, do we say that climate change began with the use of fossil fuels, or do we start talking about 500 years ago? when we began to transform this ecosystem, um, when we began to uh, appropriate land from certain communities, indigenous communities, and reorganize the ecosystem from virgin forests to other forms of ecosystems to host um, mass agriculture. Today, we, we talk about planting trees as a form of carbon sequestration, but let's not forget that we actually clear cut a great amount of forestry in this country. And it wasn't only just as a technical solution to achieve agricultural production, there was a very racialized component to that type of policy. In addition, when we look, and I think our other speakers have spoken to this, in addition, when we talk about urbanization and the expansion of urban settlement patterns, that we now know are highly carbon intensive, highly greenhouse gas intensive. Those decentralized urban patterns just didn't happen by accident, nor do they not have a racialized component. We know that suburban development and the investment of road systems and highway systems very directly had a racialized component. Not only did some communities get broken apart as a result of the construction of a transportation system, but in addition, sometimes those communities, that transportation was deliberately put in place in order to exclude some communities. Housing disinvestment, redlining, where whole communities were disinvested in. And we now have a whole building infrastructure, building envelopes that are highly energy inefficient and carbon intensive as a result. And so for me, I think we really need to think at the roots of what environmental justice is and where climate justice intersects with that. We have to think about what caused and the racialized components that helped us get to the situation that not only harms environmental systems, but also harms human communities. And we also need to think about the solutions. 
because many times the, the solutions are solely for, focused on GHG reduction and neglect these racialized and other social and economic implications of these solutions. And until and unless we integrate equity into climate solutions, whether it's climate resilience, climate mitigation policies, we're going to continue to have to deal with the harms that people are experiencing as a result of them. And that's our, that's our duty and our responsibility. To me, that's what climate justice means, is ensuring that no community will bear the brunt, will bear the cost of any particular climate solution, but also of inaction um, due to um, our inability to address climate change. Thank you so much, Dr. Martinez, for highlighting what you call the racialized components of the climate history. Um, I couldn't help but think about some of the statements from Secretary Buttigieg this, this week in relation to the infrastructure bill about um, highways having racism built into them and, and how, um, you know, how correct he is in that statement and nonetheless how controversial in some ways those remarks were in some quarters. Um, I'd like to invite you all, and I agree with you completely that the solutions that we talk about to the climate change problem have historically ignored parts of how we're defining the problem. And in part, I, that's why I'd love to start this more conversational part of the agenda by inviting you guys to be even more specific about defining the problem as you see it, because that'll help us think through more concretely what solutions make the most sense. And what I mean by that is I'd love for you, for any of you who wants to, to talk more concretely about the inequities that arise from climate change itself or from maladaptive climate solutions. You know, a lot of my students, for example, have heard talk of climate inequities, but I'd love for you to make that, or at least I invite you to make that more concrete by talking about the sorts of inequities that you see as persistent problems and that would allow us to think through a little more concretely what solutions might be to those inequities. So Keisha, you had talked about having other examples that you might raise, for example, or I invite any of you to jump in at this stage if you want to. Yeah, I just want to say that I appreciate Cecilia connecting what we're experiencing today to, to at least what I would coin racism. Um, and, and, and I think that's what climate justice allows us to do it allows us to identify the root causes of why we're experiencing this reality where communities of color are disproportionately located in areas where there's high risk of flooding. Um, we work in Virginia and I know as, as a director, I have the opportunity to travel around um, the US. And when I went to go visit my coworkers in Virginia and talk to the moms there, in the Hampton Roads area. That area um, experienced a lot of flooding. It's not, um, it's not a shock that that area is also predominantly black or low income folks of color. Um, and also when you think about here in Los Angeles and South LA, there is a number of fracking sites, even in Baldwin Hills, which historically has been a middle-class, upper-class black neighborhood. They are still um, surrounded by, by fracking. Um, in my own unique situation um, where I quote unquote thought I got out of poverty, but I'm still living near a fracking place. Um, and this neighborhood is also have a high percentage of people of color. And so I think in order for us to, um, that we do need to talk about race and that we do need to talk about how race also shapes where you live, your access to um, healthy air quality, your access to healthy food, et cetera. And I just wanted to lift up Texas um, most recently uh, when Texas went through their climate crisis. And um, I know when I was a young organizer, we often talked about, well, when, when a crisis come, upper middle class folks would be able to um, relocate. They will be able to pack up and go. And I saw that in Texas where we saw people who have money were packing up and leaving and going to Mexico. And, and, and we saw that even with some of our um, elected officials as well. And so, and then you also saw those who didn't have resources, mostly folks of color were stuck. 
and once um, and once the you know once the immediate crisis well that's um, a privilege for me to say since I'm here in California but once that immediate crisis left those people of color are left with how to repair their homes if they didn't if they don't have insurance or if they if they didn't um, they they then they're stuck with this high bill <laughs> they they're stuck with trying to figure out how to repair their home and they're also stuck with these utility bills. Um, so you begin to recognize that race class really create the type of um, your access to a healthy and livable environment. Um, and I think Hurricane Katrina is another example, predominantly black neighborhood. When, the, um, when that crisis happened, um, unfortunately, government did not adequately respond. And they failed to respond. And if you still go back to Hurricane Katrina, there still are, I'm sorry, if you still go back to New Orleans, there's still, um, you can still see what's left of that, that crisis. And you can also see that the government has also failed to respond. And so I think you can't talk about all of this without also talking about racism. And I think climate justice allows us to talk about the root cause that produce, produces this reality that most communities of color are living in. Thanks, Keisha. Anybody else want to jump in on that point or respond to other things you've heard from the panel already? Well, I think uh, one of the things, and, and actually Marisa um, talked about this in her in her presentation, and I'm in Florida and South Florida specifically, um, and some of the inequities um, that we're seeing being exacerbated by, by the climate crisis, which as we all know, is a threat mu multiplier. Um, for us, the, the most relevant are like climate gentrification. Uh, where we have seen developers and real estate agencies prey on um, vulnerable communities, communities of colors that are on high ground properties because high value properties on the coastline and low lying areas are facing rising sea levels and sunny day flooding and coastal erosion. Um, and at the same time, when you know extreme weather events like hurricanes come to Florida, these communities are are really lacking the safety nets to to get ready to 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 pass the the storm and and even be resilient after the aftermath and and many of the disproportionate impacts are also being felt not only by community of colors but also by women um, and and women you know are losing their jobs to care for elderly and the children because schools are closed for weeks and weeks of time and right now in the middle of the pandemic we're also seeing a, a, a she session um, uh, additionally to to so many other of the inequities that we have talked to, to you know talked about here today people with limited income that are living in subsidized housing often are located in floodplains with inadequate insulation mold problems um, don't lack the air conditioning to effectively combat you know severe heat or cope with those strong storms and they're also challenged to afford you know flood or fire insurance or you know, rebuild their homes in the aftermath, in the aftermath, or pay for you know the the additional medical bills after um, these extreme weather events. So I think you know what we could all agree is that all the the, the climate crisis exacerbates and and really um, puts a light into these inequity, these systemic racial and gender inequities that um, our communities are are feeling. I'm Puerto Rican by descent. Um, you know, for me, Hurricane Maria, it, it's a clear example of what second class citizenships is. Um, don't need to go back to, to repeat some of the things that we have heard here today. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, the success of, of the some of the uh, policies that we're coming seeing in the pipeline really um, have need to have the environmental justice, the climate justice, and the gender justice um, really embedded at the core of all these solutions. So looking forward to, to talk about that in, in the next uh, few minutes. So that's a fantastic segue to my next question, unless someone else wanted to jump in. I, you know, the point of trying to define the problem better is so that we have a better handle on which solutions are most likely to work. And Yoka, as you said, there's tremendous opportunity and attention being paid right now at the national stage and, and even state and local stages to some degree to the question of how to design our climate policies to address these inequities, to think about 
you know, racial justice and economic justice questions alongside climate change questions and what have traditionally been thought of as environmental questions to think about public health and, you know, and community resilience together with GHG reduction. And so I'd love to start talking in a little more detail about how those goals might be accomplished from a policy perspective to the extent you guys have views on that. And in particular, I know Dr. Martinez that you are at the heart of a team that's thinking through right now how to make President Biden's environmental justice executive order mandates real to really implement them. I'm curious, you know, what your team is thinking about what this should mean for climate policy, particularly, if you're willing to share some of that thinking with us. Sure. Well, as you as you all might know, um, the uh, the president's executive order 14008 that was signed on January 27th, which is the climate and env environmental justice ex executive order that we talk about, names um, basically three very clear and significant roles for the intersection of environmental justice and climate justice. The first is a rather large initiative, and that is what we call Justice 40. And that is that 40% of the investments in clean energy, clean transportation, workforce development, and, and legacy policy reduction will go to quote unquote disadvantaged communities. Now, not getting stuck on the terminology or sort of because it, you know, disadvantaged communities sort of implies one thing, and I would prefer to call them overburdened um, communities. Um, but nonetheless, that 40% of the investment benefits um, will go directly to those communities. Now, the big question which everybody is asking is, well, what constitutes a benefit? Um, and secondly, um, how do we actually implement that? Given um, what all of our speakers have talked about, that the issue of climate change and environmental justice are at very intersectional. It requires housing, it requires HUD, it requires energy, it requires DOE, it requires transportation investments, it requires DOT, it requires health investments, it requires HHS. And each of those agencies have very different funding streams and very different ways in which programmatic dollars get out the door. And so a key component of what we are working on now is, first of all, how to identify the programs um, across the federal government that could directly go to that 40% benefit priority. Um, that's a huge lift in and itself. So gathering all that data of all the programs of billions of dollars that we can direct to priority communities. The second component of that is what types of investments may we may need to tweak in order to ensure that those go to directly to these priority communities. And thirdly, the option is, of course, um, given certain funding streams, for example, DOT um, has a significant, most of its dollars are in formula grants, which are basically passed through grants to state and local governments. They don't have the discretion to be able to define how and where those grants go to. So the next question is, what do we, need, what do, we do with respect to that kind of investment funding? How do we tweak those? What is necessary? Um, to get those dollars toward disadvantaged communities. And so that is very high on our agenda now. We have interagency discussions, conversations, planning, strategy sessions. At CEQ, we have a great uh, group of people, somebody who's advising on transportation, emissions reductions, uh, land and conservation, the whole gamut of issue areas. Um, so that we ensure we're ensuring that equity and environmental justice, climate injustice are basically being integrated into all those avenues. And the second area, because I want to give my fellow panelists a, a time to talk, is the development of a climate and economic justice screening tool. Um, as we know, data, good data, valid data, reliable data, abundant data, robust data, around what the conditions are of our communities is sorely lacking. That field is very immature, comparatively speaking, to the other kinds of data that we have around climate change. And that needs to change. We need to have good data that is community accessible, that, that, that community members 
hopefully you can still hear me because I think my internet went out. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so that we so that we develop. Let me see. Oh, but Cecilia, now we can't. I think you you're muted. That work? Ah, uh, there you go. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So we need to develop that kind of data to ensure that communities have the tools and the information to be able to advocate for themselves. After all, that's what a democracy is, right? That we're able to have the information that everybody has. Everybody has good information to be able to be self-determinant and participate in the decisions that affect our lives. So the climate and economic justice screening tool is very important initiative that we're working on to try and build out that kind of information for our communities. Thanks. That's right. And I Thanks. also um, really appreciate that, Cecilia. And I think, um, you know, really just building on that point around data, I think it's uh, a really big um, need right now in a couple of sort of policy areas. Um, I think especially when we're talking about you know, I think you mentioned also moving beyond um, GHG reductions as our measure of tracking how well we're doing. And I think that's really important. I think something that we also need to do coming from NRDC. Uh, and I think sometimes when we talk about, you know, getting to 50% reduction of 2005 level levels, you know, what do we really mean by that? Are, you know, are we accounting for poverty also within those 2005 levels? And, you know, the fact that, um, there's a recognition that we need to increase um, wealth for for people. Um, and I think some people might think of this kind of as a trade off here, but I think, you know, there's a way to kind of come up with solutions so that everyone can be part of the uh, economy. Um, and I think, um, you know, in LA, there's a couple of pieces that our partners are working around. Um, related to Measure A, um, which was uh, funding for uh, access to parks in the Los Angeles region. And we have um, partners with the uh, LA Regional Open Space and Affordable Housing Group that have worked on getting displacement measures integrated into the, um, into the policies around uh, funding for parks. Um, and so I think these are some of the ways that people are thinking about, you know, synergies so that you're making sure that people are living in affordable housing and accessing these re resilient benefits. Um, similarly, I think in California with cap and trade, right? You know, you're trying to reduce these emissions, but there's these unintended consequences. So are we, how are we looking at data? Are we including racial impact assessment tools within our policies? Are we looking at housing impact assessment tools in our policies to really get to the impact and look at, you know, disaggregating all of that data by race because you know, I think that only helps us strengthen our policies. Um, and I think it's a really important piece, uh, especially right now. Um, you know, and I'm also, I wanted to respond, Yoka, I'm also uh, Puerto Rican. And I think, you know, Maria was, uh, you know, some of my own family was displaced from, from, from Maria and didn't, you know, move back. Um, and I think that, you know, there's also this piece around environmental and climate justice where there's this need to address the issue, but also have these positive solutions in place. And this wider view of justice is something that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of, you know, remembering, um, you know, my, my parents and grandparents who advocated to put solar on the roof of their house because, you know, it was this great investment and good for the environment. And just the fact that, you know, people on the ground have solutions um, as well. And, you know, in thinking about the policies, you know, the data is really important, but that, that the people also are the data um, and, and, and that there's, you know, beyond sort of this deficit framing, you know, this is where I think sort of the data gets implemented on the ground. That raises an interesting question for me, and I invite um, Keisha, Yoka, Marissa, any of you, or for that matter, Dr. Martinez to weigh in. Um, I'm curious how you think the Biden administration should integrate the voices of community into its policy making because you know you've all talked about the importance of these solutions 
being to, at least to some degree community led. And at the same time, there's all this national momentum and um, DC is pretty far from a lot of the communities where you guys do a lot of your work. And so I'm wondering if you have ideas about how and where those two sh should meet those two ideas. Well, if I can from, I guess, you know, from a local and, and state perspective where the Clear Institute works most of, I think, you know, the transition itself to be just and equitable, um, it, it really needs to open the participation at all levels. And I think people must have a say in the decision that, you know, decisions that affect their life. Decision makers most, most include communities in the policy process. They need to have a seat at the table and the table is full, full. They need to bring a folding chair. They need to make sure they, they do have a voice. And I also think, you know, no group should shoulder alone the burdens of, of this transition, you know, from a fossil fuel based economy to a energy based, renewable energy based economy. The transition, the just transition needs to create opportunities for, you know, displaced workers and, and communities to participate in the new um, economy. And I think, you know, the government must center those voices and especially those that are going to be impacted the most so we can build the, 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 the thriving economies and provide, dig, you know, dignified jobs. And, but at the same time, assuring that we have productive and ecological sustainable livelihood. So I, I think, you know, a, a participatory, collaborative, holistic approach to solution is key. But again, you know, the communities need to have um, a louder voice and really guiding those policy making decisions. So um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, let the other ones weigh in because I'm sure that they have other valuable uh, insights as well. I just want to underscore uh, what you said, um, because I do think that is true. What I have heard over my 15 years, community organizing communities, organizing communities of color, and even um, for a moment, I actually also worked for the US government um, for a congressional member. And so what I heard overwhelmingly is that people want to be at the table, that and that what we know to be true as organizers is that those who are most impacted are better positioned to address what the solutions are. And so sometimes even, you know, as leadership in nonprofits, sometimes we think we have all the answers because we went to school and we've been studying this issue and, and we know what's best. Um, but what the community constantly reminds us, whether we're a nonprofit, whether we're government, is that ask, to, ask us what we want. And most importantly is that it's not a one solution fits all. At a national organization, my issues in California is completely different than the issues in New York and, and, and so forth. And so how do we do that during COVID <laughs> is another question. And I think, um, and I think definitely, and I just also want to say that I appreciate what the Biden administration is doing. And I appreciate that one, we're having this conversation, we're talking about EJ, and we're talking about an intersectional approach. And is there a way for the White House to have phone calls, um, come out to visit, come out to talk to communities um, in a safe way during COVID um, so that they can tell you what their issues are, so that they can tell you what their solutions are and they can tell you how they can access those, uh, be, make those solutions accessible. Um, so we, you know, and so I think we got to talk to the community. We have to center them in any policy making, um, and we have to understand the unique challenges that each community have, and that, and not approach policy with a blanket approach. That is. Can I jump in and just um, affirm one hundred and fifty percent what what both Keisha and Yuka uh, um, said. And, and just to identify a couple of areas where, where, where we're looking to do that. First, first um, the first ever White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council was stood up this year. Um, that council has approximately 30 um, people from communities across the country who have been working on environmental justice and climate justice. Now, obviously, there are many, many more capable and able people to be in a council like that. So you can imagine that 
um, whittling it down to a manageable 30 was in and of itself an incredible feat because just the wealth of knowledge and the wealth of experience in our communities. But nonetheless, it's historic in the sense that for the first time, there is a White House Advisory Council who is speaking directly to the White House offices about their perspectives about what is needed um, for their communities. And they've already started engaging these three important areas. One is the Justice 40 initiative, their recommendations to the administration about how that should play out. The second one is how the climate and economic justice screening tool should, um, should be implemented and developed. But, and thirdly, and I think this is really critical, the landmark executive order 12898 that was basically framing the federal government's approach to environmental justice was written during the Clinton administration in the early 90s. It has not been modernized since then. And so the idea is that the WEJAC is also providing recommendations on how to modernize 12898, get us into the 21st century, make sure that there are components of that executive order that creates the opportunities and requires agencies to do the kind of work that we're all talking about here. And then in addition to that, agencies are really developing outreach strategies. Now, um, I think, you know, that's going to be a learning curve for some agencies, to be honest. I mean, we, we have to be honest. This is, it's sort of what Keisha, you said for your organization. There's, there's sort of the vision and then there's where we're at at the baseline. And some agencies have probably been doing it better than others. Um, and even some departments in some agencies have probably been doing it better than others. But what I am seeing is that there is a real intentionality from the top to say, look, this has to happen, figure it out, and let's figure out how to get it implemented. And that is why there's also in that executive order the um, mandate that an environmental justice scorecard be developed that basically creates performance metrics for each agency so that we know and can evaluate how the agency is doing, not just take it for granted, but really have a way of monitoring and evaluating whether or not we're making progress on these things and where things need to change in order to continue to make progress on this. Um, I'm not going to lie, it's a learning experience. And I think I'm, this is the first time for me in government. So for me, it's a learning experience, but together, I think with, we keep building these partnerships, we keep building this collaboration, we keep building this community oriented way of doing things, and we will definitely be much better off than we have been historically. I'm really curious if you're willing to share, and I recognize it's probably still very much in draft form, but I'm really curious what metrics might be tracked on an EJ scorecard. Yes, well, it varies much in formulation stage. Um, so I can actually give you probably a progress um, and progress uh, on that um, somewhere around July. Um, that's where we're kind of looking to actually have um, more, possibly some more public ideas about how that is being implemented. Great, thanks. Marissa, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just was going to plus one, everything both of you said, and especially, you know, uplifting Keisha, um, your point around uh, life experience uh, as being really valuable to being part of this conversation. Um, and, you know, we often kind of think of, you know, our learned experience at, at school and things like that. But, you know, I think in thinking about this whole person approach um, and, and the fact that, you know, that my health and well-being live within my body, you know, we have to really uh, underscore the value of the lived experience. Um, and I think, you know, to some extent, the Biden administration has also been hiring really uh, excellent people like Cecilia um, and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, diverse uh, and smart people, but also people that have that real life experience that are, um, you know, proximal to um, the issues that we're trying to solve, which I think is really important. Um, and I think, you know, the whole government approach is really, um, 
going to be a big piece uh, that that is a, an opportunity. Um, and I think is also, you know, the, the longer systems change is going to be the bigger challenge, um, getting to that self determination where, where, you know, within policies, uh, communities can really uh, speak for themselves. Um, and, and we'll need to be sort of balancing the speed at which the administration is going to want to get things done in the next two or four years. Um, but also in real time needing to engage with with groups traditionally left out of policy or funding decisions. And so I think part of that is, you know, ensuring that even beyond um, government that we're resourcing anchor institutions and communities um, that we're accountable if we're a local uh, decision maker or in another um, capacity accountable, you know, what are the pieces that we're putting in place to be accountable to a community? You know, and I think to some extent policy and, and the way we interact is, is a design problem, which is a human problem, which is defined by our, our values. So if we have racist values, we'll have racist out outcomes. If we have anti-racist principles and values, we should have anti-racist outcomes. And we can design our policy and our engagement strategies to be anti-racist um, as the people behind them. Um, and, and I think, you know, everyone is part of the movement. I think the government, our community organizations, our anchor institutions, philanthropy, um, to really ensure that we um, are able to reach uh, everyone and sustain that in the long term. Thanks, Marissa. We're starting to get some questions rolling into the chat. I'll encourage folks to um, to add more of them. If you have questions to the panel, I'll take a look at the chat and I'll, I'll do my best to keep up with them. The first one I want to highlight um, makes the point that although GHG reductions are not a sufficient thing to track or to pay attention to, they are essential and necessary. And the questioner um, raises the proposal for a carbon tax and dividend that is contained in the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act and asks, I think, about your views on carbon taxes or carbon tax and dividend proposals generally. And I, I guess I'll add one more layer to this question, which is, do you think there's a sense in which layering on questions about racial justice goals and economic justice goals and intersectional goals detracts at all from core GHD reduction goals? Or do you actually see them enhancing each other and you know, we get further, faster, and farther if we think of them all together than if we think of them individually. I'm curious how you think about these relationships politically as much as anything else. Um, well, I can say that, I, I don't know, Yoka, do you want to go? Uh, I don't want to interrupt. I, no, 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 please go. Okay. Um, I can say that the climate justice environmental justice movement has been fighting for several decades to make sure that they are integrated. That the history of the climate field has been largely around GHG reductions and that it took quite a lot of pushing and advocacy from climate justice, from environmental justice communities, from communities who are advocating about that intersectionality that all of uh, the panelists are talking about to get to a national agenda that actually acknowledges that you cannot achieve GHG reduc reductions without dealing with these other racial and social economic issues, precisely for the reason that we've been talking about. Because in the end, you end up creating a situation where some communities will bear the cost of the implementation of the solutions and other communities will bear the benefits of implementation of some of those communities. And in aggregate, we may achieve GHG reductions, but some communities may actually be worse off. And those are the, that's what we mean by when we talk about democracy being at the uh, center of this, and justice being at the center of this. I apologize, my phone is ringing in the background. Um, that, that is what we mean by climate justice. You cannot achieve a GHG reduction and save the planet because we then talk about who are we saving the planet for? And is that what we're about? Are we about only saving the planet for some communities and not others? 
And so that would, I'm going to stop there because I think my, my phone is really <laughs> in the background. I, I'm going to just name that the call of justice. Dr. Martinez, that's how I'm thinking about that ringing that we all heard in the background. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in on this question, either of the carbon tax and dividend proposal in particular or the broader version of that question? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on the carbon um, tax uh, component of it since Dr. Martinez already addressed the, the, the first part of the, of the question. And I think, you know, in, in our movement, we have unfortunately been looking for tunnel vision kind of solutions, right? And finding that silver bullet that is gonna solve um, the, the, the crisis we, we are facing. And I think, you know, inevitably we have to curb pollution. And one of the mechanisms that we have is putting a price on that pollution. Um, to speak about the specific bill that um, the attendant talked about, which is the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, um, you know, lobby by um, CCL, Climate Citizens Lobby. Um, you know, this this is not a tax; it's a dividend. So, so the money will go back to the people. But they, you know, I cannot talk specifically about that bill, I do advocate for pricing pollution. I think we need to price pollutions and pollut pollution polluters need to um, take responsibility of their pollution, just like we citizens pay for our trash and our garbage and are fine when we pollute, you know, our parks and beaches and in our community. Um, we cannot treat our atmosphere as an open source. So, um, you know, from a general sense, uh, putting a price on carbon that doesn't burden any community, um, it, it is definitely something that we feel needs to be part of the toolbox. Not the only silver bullet or the only solution, but part of the toolbox. Thanks, Yoka. Um, other great questions are rolling in. One has to do with the big climate summit that's gonna happen in the White House starting, I think on April 22nd. Um, of course, Dr. Martinez, if you want to give us a sneak peek of what you think we might see coming out of that summit, that's fantastic. And to all of you more generally, I'm curious what you want to see coming out of that summit. I think we're likely to see a, a big splashy GHG reduction pledge. And I'm wondering what else you'd like to see. It looks like they're all waiting for the sneak peek Ah, okay, so they're waiting for me. Uh, <laughs> so yes, um, the summit, incredible. I think, um, first of all, let me just, you know, I mean, it's something we all acknowledge that for the first time, it's for the first time in a while, um, we, 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 are in, we are at a place where the federal government has identified climate change is real and, climate, and that we must act on climate change. <laughs> For, for, for the planet, for the future of our generations, et cetera. And so um, we're coming back to the inter international arena. We are um, making this a critical um, piece of work in terms of, um, as you all know, there are two offices at the White House, one that Secretary Harry Kerry leads, um, which is the International Climate Office, and then the office that um, former EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy leads, which is the domestic uh, White House Climate Office. Those two offices, obviously it's not an accident that they've been established and it's not an accident that they are both at the White House. Um, there's a great deal of interaction that is going on between those two offices because number one, we need to establish ourselves as a global leader. As Secretary Kerry has uh, consistently said, um, we need to move beyond the Paris Agreement. We need to make sure that the work that we do in terms of our uh, commitments uh, to the world are grounded in the science of what needs to be done and that we are um, good partners and good actors in the world in assisting um, those who have those countries that have less resources be able to, to move and develop in a way that is sustainable for the planet. That is the agenda there. On the domestic side, it's to ensure then that all of the solutions and the climate actions that we do, that we are actually showing that we are a good actor, that we are moving with our state and local governments, with our communities, 
and that most importantly, that the work that we're doing is going to shore up that we are actually committed to this work. And I think the summit is going to be that arena where it is both showing the domestic work, the incredible domestic agenda and domestic work that is happening, but also making sure that we show the world that we are committed um, to um, being the leader that we need to be to address climate change. And I think the trick, and we all know this, will be to give that message along with some assurances, especially to external audiences, that the United States can commit in a, you know, in an enduring way to the things we're saying we're committed to today. It's, it's tricky given the structure of our democracy. So I'll be curious to see how the White House messages that. Um, this next question maybe is most appropriate for Keisha and Yoka if she's still on, although she may have had to just drop off because it's about community engagement and including questions of community engagement in the era of COVID. We have a question in the chat from someone who's working with a community group in California to raise awareness of issues related to environmental justice and is curious if folks have good ideas about how best to do that work, especially in an era of COVID where it's hard to go door to door or to take other traditional methods. And then I may wrap this question actually together with another one, which is um, about how mainstream environmental groups not founded in environmental justice priorities can really position themselves to help groups that are working more on the ground and with communities more squarely on environmental justice concerns. Yeah, I can quickly take a stab at both. Um, one, I would say my organization, we uh, we were used to grassroots organizing door-to-door, -door, face to face outreach engagement. So we're actually still learning as well of how to do this digitally. Um, and we're hopeful that hopefully we can all get back very soon to that face-to-face. Um, I would suggest Color of Change um, seems to be an organization that has figured out how to do digital organizing. So that might be one organization you want to reach out to. In regards to how can traditional um, or mainstream environmental groups uh, begin to work on EJ, I would say um, that one, and this is also what I'm hoping to come out of the summit on the 22, 22nd, is that that we that mainstream organizations fully understand the connection to race and that we're able to articulate that in a way that is not um, that's authentic um, and so that we are not trying to put the horse or i'm not going to say that because i don't know how but the phrase but we are doing it in a way that we are first educating ourselves and we fully understand how all of this are connected and then we go out and try to do the work and then once we go out and do the work, know that change is not gonna happen to, uh, tomorrow because the communities are gonna be distrustful of, of mainstream white organizations. So you're gonna have to spend a lot of time in the relationship building and building trust with communities before you're able to organize them and ask them to join your movement. Um, so I would say educate yourself, fully understand the connections of race and environment, and then when, you when you're ready to go out into the world, start building relationships and know that although we uh, are on a short clock, the communities are not on that. They're not gonna respond to urgency. They're gonna respond to let's build a relationship. I wanna get to know you. I wanna get to know your issue. And then we can go from there. Yeah, and I think um, just building on that, you know, as someone who's in a uh, traditional big green organization, I just, you know, wanna also plus one, that piece around um, the commitments to climate action and out of the summit, um, but also what are the stakes that we can put in the ground, right? Because administrations change, leaderships change, you know, that commitment, we want it to be really lasting. I feel like that's really important. Um, but this question, you know, it's it's a big question. It's something that I, you know, that keeps me up at night. And I think um, it's some of the hardest part of some of the work is, you know, um, being able to understand like what's a limit, what's a real limit, what's a limitation right now, and you know where we can push. Um, and I think sometimes in our work, um, you know, especially with Spark, when we have community partners, um, they're ahead of us, you know, in terms of what what they want to say, and we want to back them up. 
um, but at the same time, we don't want to hold our partners back. Um, so it's a it's a hard line to walk. And I think communication, relationship building, it's being really really explicit is like at the top of the priority. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, an institution that's on a journey, but we're not a justice organization at all. Um, and and I think being upfront and clear about that is 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 really important. Um, I think if if there's resources, you know that we have that we could pass through or, or stand aside so other people can access them. Um, I, I would really like to see four big greens um, doing that um, to make sure that resources flow again to the community and the justice partners that really need them. Um, and, you know, be a, a partner in the best way that we can. Um, so it's, it's, it's isn't always easy. And I think, you know, sometimes there's the internal pieces of like, where can we really align and be really clear and, and kind of say, you know, this is where we want to push and this is where, you know, we're going to step back. Thanks, Marissa. And I did just get a text from Yoka. Her Wi-Fi went out. This is just the era we live in. So she apologizes. She'll jump back in if she can. Um, but we only have a few more minutes and I have lots of um, law school students, among others, um, in the room, in the Zoom room. So I'd love to end just by inviting each of you as panelists to talk a little bit about what future lawyers could do to help advance the work that you do and your priorities. If you have inspiring words for our students, now's the time. I was thinking about this because I saw it as one of our questions and because I had an opportunity to work with Beth uh, when she was fresh out of law school. Um, I would say the contribution is help uh, a lot of grassroots organizations are not really focused on policy. And so law, law students can help us better understand the policies that are coming out that, that were created either today or 10 years down the line that's continued to impact our communities. Um, I think when we think about the fossil fuel industry, we need a lot of legal support. This is an industry that has a lot of resources and a lot of power, um, and we need help on how to, how to hold them accountable um, using legal strategies. In addition to a host of other things that I, I'm sure we can benefit from, from attorneys, but I'll pass it to others. Um, well, I would say there's two, I, ditto everything she just said, and then there's a, I would, I would look at it in sort of two parts. One is we need um, the legal field itself to be pushing the envelope. Um, one of the things when I was not in government and, and um, working in environmental justice and climate and energy, we, we kept asking the question, well, what, you know, can we have this particular piece um, uh, moving forward based on the Clean Air Act. And we, what we kept getting back is, well, no, not really. We don't think that, you know, that you'll be able to, to get that through. Um, and it may not fit within the Clean Air Act. And what we need is people to say, huh, good question. Let's be bold. Let's be innovative. Let's push the envelope. We are doing it in many other ways. And we have to be doing it with respect to equity and justice with, and climate. And then in the second part, I would just ditto what Keisha said. And in the practice, we definitely need folks who are going to be committed um, to communities who don't have the resources and sometimes don't even have the resources to know how to ask the right questions from the legal community. And so building that infrastructure so that that uh, legal um, set of resources can be accessible is gonna be critically important. Yeah, uplifting everything that was just said. I mean, I think, you know, especially in these big legal policies, you know, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, understanding the levers at the local level of how to keep pieces enforced um, related to, you know, air quality, water quality, um, and and to be innovators as well, I think is really important. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I think just, um, uh, well, you know, being a translator, I think, between being on a, the community scale and, and the legal and the policy piece is a, is a need. Um, and then and lastly, just, you know, I think finding the, the piece that you're passionate about and, and going with it, because, you know, none of this is, um, you know, easy. I think we're all sort of 
here because we're passionate about it. And so just that's my just general recommendation for um, for people who are still students. All right, so to my students in the Zoom room, you have your marching orders. Thank you guys so much, each of the panelists, and um, please join me in thanking them to everyone who's with us today. I was really inspired by this conversation um, and I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot. And um, I hope some of you did too. Um, in the chat, you'll find some information about other panels that are unfolding as part of our Emmett Institute Symposium, including one this Friday on clean air for everyone, air pollution, fence line communities, and racism. So speaking of naming racism, we, we name it in the subtitle of that panel. You can join us on Friday if you want to learn more. Thank you all so much. I'll let you all go. And it was really a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you.